I am Adrian Haberstadt, Director of Criminal Justice here at Berkeley College, and I welcome you again to my YouTube channel, The Justice Center at Dr. Halvey. We're working through a playlist which I've titled Intro to Philosophy. This is uh, video number three, and we're going to be s drilling down on the benefits of philosophy and the basic methodologies used in philosophy. But first, how about a few jokes? Why did the existentialist cross the road? To get to the other side, or not? How many philosophers does it take to change a light bulb? None. They would just stand around and argue whether or not the light bulb even exists. What do you get when you cross a philosopher with a vampire? Someone who stays up all night pondering the meaning of eternal life. Did you hear about the philosopher who fell into a deep hole? He spent the next five hours debating whether or not he should climb out. Why did the philosopher break up with his girlfriend? Because she kept asking him to define their relationship. <laughs> oh, these jokes may be a little quirk, quirky or silly, but they're a play on some of the common themes and ideas associated with the study of philosophy. So what's the benefit of studying philosophy? Well. Through the study of philosophy, we develop critical thinking skills. It teaches us to think critically and question everything. Through philosophy, we analyze arguments, identify fallacies, and evaluate evidence. These skills are useful in every area of life. And why is that? Because philosophy is in everything. <laughs> it also helps expand our worldview. Philosophy exposes us to a wide range of ideas and perspectives, and we can't help but to uh, use that uh, in regards to honing our own thought process and determining what our own will, worldview is and to compare it with the Word of God. And, and uh, we become better people and have better focus in life and understand our purpose by studying philosophy. It improves our communication skills. The nature of philosophy requires us to engage in discussion and debate with other, and that improves communication skills such as speaking and listening effectively. It also enhances our problem-solving skills. It forces us to deal with complex problems that do not have easy answers. Through this process, we learn how to break down hard problems and analyze them from multiple angles, which can help us develop problem-solving skills. We can also develop a sense of personal values through philosophy. The nature of philosophy causes us to look into ethics and morality and values. And by engaging these questions and wrestling through them, we develop a better understanding of our own personal values and beliefs. Philosophy can be understood simply as the sum of all of our beliefs, or the life commandments that we live by. This type of philosophy is oftentimes referred to as non-scientific. The sum of our beliefs, or the life commandments that we live by, are oftentimes not tested. They're non-scientific. Generally speaking, non-scientific philosophy or blind philosophy means holding to something as true without testing it. Non-scientific philosophy is often described as secondary philosophy. And realistically, most people make decisions and take actions in life based upon a set of beliefs that have not been tested. However, when we speak of philosophy as a science, we are referring to the examination of what we believe. Through philosophy, we think our way to a well-grounded set of beliefs. William Hawking, in his book, The Types of Philosophy, says, The field of philosophy holds that we cannot, as human beings, remain satisfied with dumb stubbornness in holding to our beliefs. So what are some of the basic tools and or methodologies used in philosophy? In video two, we talked about Socrates and how he was known as the father and a father of Western philosophy, mostly due to his 
Socratic method of inquiry. The Socratic method of philosophy involves dialogue between two or more individuals where one person asks a series of questions to another in order to stimulate critical thinking and to arrive at deeper understanding of a particular concept or idea. The, the Socratic method is often used today in academia and in research to challenge assumptions and uncover hidden beliefs and expose contradictions in arguments. Socrates believed that knowledge and wisdom could only be attained through questions and inquiry rather than through just the passes of passive acceptance of dogma or received wisdom. The Socratic method typically begins with a question that is meant to stimulate reflection and discussion. The person being questioned is encouraged to provide answers, which are then scrutinized and criticized by the questioner. This process continues until a deeper understanding is reached and any false assumptions or weak assumptions or contradictions are brought to light. The Socratic method is a powerful tool for promoting critical thinking, encouraging intellectual humility, and fostering a deeper appreciation for the complexity of the world and the human experience. And my friends, it has been around, it was, it's been around since the time, 400 years before Jesus Christ, and it's still useful today. It's one of the basic methods that we use when we're doing the work of philosophy, particularly when we're doing it with other people. It's a good model to use. A working definition of philosophy is the analysis, clarification, and criticism of the language, concepts, and logics of the ends and means of human experience. A definition comes from Robert Sherman Durfer in his book, Differing Concepts of Philosophy. It is the analysis, clarification, and criticism of the language that's being used by asking the questions, the concepts that's being presented, and the logic of the ends and means of human experience. So another methodology for doing philosophy is what I refer to as the philosopher's toolbox, and it's kind of built on this particular philosophy that I just shared with you from different concepts of philosophy. The term philosopher's toolbox references the process for doings, for the doings of the work of philosophy. As a philosopher, you analyze, you clarify, you criticize and you contribute. Let's unpack those for a moment. When we analyze, we reduce complex ideas or human situations into understandable concepts. We've got to be able to relate to something before we can figure it out. Through analysis, essential conceptions that drive behavior and emotion are extracted from the activity that it produces so that it may be, may be more easily understood and debated. So we pull it out beyond just the behavior. We pull out the thinking process and we analyze that for the sake of understanding. Closely related to analysis is clarifying. We need clarification in order to do philosophy. All too often we simply take for granted that humans have common experiences that lead to commonly held understandings of what we communicate to each other. Good example of this would be the old story of, of the, the young girl who asked her mother one day, why do we always cut off the end of the roast before we cook it? And mom says, I don't know, we should probably ask grandma because she always did. I just assumed that was the thing to do. So they went to grandma and they said, grandma, why did you cut off the end of the roast each time before you baked it? And she said, well, the roast was too big for my pan. So I cut it off. We see 
Practices like that can become a life commandment. It can be a rule that we live by. It may have worked at a previous time, but that doesn't mean it needs to be a life commandment for today. As a responsible philosopher, we must challenge and ultimately clarify those concepts we use to make sense of the world. Paradigms people often take for granted rather than clarification or clarifying them need to be understood. One such example would be for centuries people believed the world was flat and it wasn't until somebody challenged that thinking process and actually sailed around the world did they come to discover that the world was not flat. As a philosopher, we seek clarification. We ask why in hopes of coming to understanding. The third tool we use in doing the work of a philosopher is criticism. Criticism means making judgments as to the value. Philosophers judge the practical values of concepts. They ask, does this concept work? And if not, how can this concept be improved upon? Or does it need to just be done away with altogether? These tools will help you as a philosopher to investigate and then intercede between experience and concept. A fourth tool in the toolbox for doing philosophy is contribution. You're probably asking, Adrian, what's this all about, this contribution thing? What do I can contribute to or contribute to? Well, through philosophy, doing the work, we contribute to our own personal formation and maturity. We also, second of all, contribute to the formation, to the discipleship of others. And three, we contribute to what is known as the Great Conversation. The Great Conversation speaks of a thousand or more years of scholarship that has defined society as we know it today and established what we know to be true. And through you doing the work um, of, a, of a philosopher by analyzing everything, seeking clarification, criticizing whether or not those philosophies work, then you can contribute not only to your own value and your own maturation, but to others as well. And you too can contribute to what we know is truth. We need Christian philosophers today who are doing the work of uh, philosophy and contributing to our society our society is upside down in terms of understanding truth and it needs men and women of God like you to think well, to speak well, to challenge well, and then to contribute to the vast knowledge that we already have so that this world can be a much better place. By using philosophical methods such as the two we just discussed, we have a basic format for doing philosophy with another person. And also through the philosopher's toolbox, we can also work philosophy among ourselves. Two great tools that you can use and have at your disposal. Through using these various models of doing philosophy, we can eliminate blind philosophy. Blind philosophy is philosophy that is non-scientific or has not been tested. We can also accentuate scientific philosophy by how we live our lives and what we say and do. We, through testing hypotheses, using research methodology such as critical analysis and ultimately leading to the place to the where we contribute to the great conversation we increase the knowledge of society and help build a civil society for all to live in 
The book of Acts tells us that God determines our days and places us in a certain geographic lo lo excuse me, a certain geographic location for the sake of his kingdom and his work. This is your God-appointed time to shine. Do the work of a skilled philosopher. Teach others to do the same and transform culture back to God's original purpose and design. God is calling us to be philosophers today.